So this is the last one, the best one, I hope. <laughs> so the title of this talk is how to have perfect vulnerability reports and still get hacked. And our speakers for today is Zach Newman and Luca Guerra. Welcome. Thank you. you. Thank you. So welcome and thank you for staying for the last talk of the day. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so today, uh, Zach and I will tell you more about uh, how uh, we can have perfect vulnerability reports and still get hacked because yes, we needed uh, someone to explain. So I am Luca and I work uh, as a senior engineer at Sysdig. I, uh, during my normal uh, work, work day, I work uh, on a project called Falco that is runtime security uh, based, uh, but my background is pretty much everything security from security research to engineering. So I really feel a bit right at home here at Vsites and Hacker Summer Camp Week. So, and I have the pleasure today to speak with uh, uh, Zach, who is an awesome uh, researcher and research scientist at ChainGuard, a company that does specialize in supply chain security. So a lot of the cool stuff that we'll be talking about today. And also, uh, he he's very expert about crypto, where crypto means cryptography. So you can take a look at uh, uh, his blogs. Uh, I, I wish I could understand half of them. So what uh, actually are we talking about uh, today? So today, uh, we'll be, of course, we'll explain how our vulnerability report can be perfect while we get hacked. So in order to do that, uh, we'll take a look at how these vulnerability reports are produced. So what are, the, uh, what are the tools that we use? Uh, software composition analysis, we know. We have heard so much about SAS bombs, uh, so we'll take a look at that tool and uh, how the whole process works. And by understanding how the whole process works, uh, we know pretty much where the blind spots are, that none of this, to spoiler, none of this technology is perfect, uh, but they are actually useful and where. So let's get started. Uh, of course, we all love vulnerabilities. Uh, we all uh, love uh, looking for them, patching them, all that stuff. And uh, if you think about a time when maybe you, you, weren't, you weren't shipping software to production, maybe a happier time, I'm sure you were happier. I was when I wasn't shipping software to production. I could ask myself how much vulnerable software I wanted in my production environment. And of course, I want none. Why, which stupid person would ever have vulnerable software, especially software that you know it is vulnerable in their production environment. Well, as it turns out, really in the real world, you can't have that. Uh, uh, we all know that you can't have a system that is automatically at the latest and greatest version. And of course, uh, we're not even thinking about uh, uh, zero days. We think about vulnerabilities that are very well known to everyone. And uh, yet, uh, every time uh, we read on Twitter or X, that uh, you should patch your system immediately and it's very hard to do in, in the real world. And uh, uh, I just found this, uh, while I was taking a look at the content for this talk, I just found this tweet, X, uh, that, uh, that was saying basically that there are environments that run CentOS 5 that are critical business production environments that we rely on somehow. So uh, yeah, it's, it gets hard to do the theoretical thing. but. We're not using CentOS here. Uh, we, are, we work at uh, cloud native companies. Uh, we all use modern cloud native environments uh, that, um, so uh, we have containers. And so containers are based on the idea that if it works on my machine, we'll ship the entire thing uh, as a file system structure and it will work, the software will work. We got there uh, and, and we're happy, but we're also dragging all the vulnerabilities we have in there within the container. And now we don't have to care about the host, we have to care about a lot of containers that are potentially vulnerable. So how do we even start at keeping track of all these vulnerabilities and everything that we have in our systems? Well, fortunately we got tools. We've got software composition analysis or vulnerability scanners. Uh, we've heard about them, we've probably used them, I've used them and I also worked on one. So. I think, uh, uh, I think we're familiar. We're, it, they're pretty much a magic box. If we think about the container image, uh, you take your container image uh, and uh, you just shove them into the magic box uh, and out comes a list of, vulnerability, of vulnerabilities. This is really useful. This is awesome because I can take any container that 
anyone generated, even a third party vendor, open source, whatever I have. I just push there and I get the vulnerabilities. Think about when Log4Shell hit, you could uh, use uh, open source or commercial solutions that are pretty mature. You would just run it on everything you have uh, in your clusters uh, and that would just work. But let's take a look at how the magic box works. If you think about it, the magic box are actually at least two magic boxes. One uh, is, is a content detection part. So you take the image and you try to figure out what's in there. And the second detects the vulnerabilities. Uh, the, the stuff that is in the middle, uh, it, we call it an SBOM, Software Bill of Materials. It's basically a list of things that are contained in our image and in our software. So, well, let's focus on the first part first. So content detection, yes, that's great. How do we do that? Uh, you take the container image and it's got layers. Uh, uh, you get a squash file system representation of those layers. And uh, your software composition analysis tool will just go and look for any piece of metadata that it can find uh, to find the, the packages and the dependencies that are installed there. So the package, Go has that embedded in the binary, or in, if you open a jar file, you know that it's basically a glorified zip. Uh, with stuff inside, you might find manifests that they may contain uh, good information. Uh, but sometimes stuff doesn't, well, I mean, doesn't really go wrong, but some stuff cannot be detected here. Because uh, uh, we need for software composition analysis to have enough metadata in there in order to, you know, find what the software is. And uh, if it exists and it didn't make into the SBOM, then uh, it's like uh, um, our, our friends at Shengard has coined the term for this, uh, that is software dark matter. It's not in the S-bone, which means that we don't know what it is and we don't know it's there, but it's still there. So we did, uh, according to a report that Zach will tell us more about, uh, software dark matter composes, might compose uh, even more than 60% of the software in an image. So. Uh, for me, the question is more like, do I care about that? Is there any piece of software there that I'm actually interested in? So let's take a look at an image. I got Apache, I scanned it with a, a software composition and nice tool. I got my s -bone. It's a bunch of stuff. 126 packages categorized as, as Debian. First of all, do I care about the ones that I see? Yes, I do. So uh, I know that the HTTP server is the HTTP binary. If I list the dependencies, uh, I'll find that uh, basically uh, there's a bunch of, the, of libraries that are dynamically linked, uh, and each and every one of those uh, uh, has a corresponding package. So if we find the vulnerability, say, in the uh, regular expression libraries, I will actually be able to, uh, to understand that this is vulnerable. And it's going to affect my server, so I want to know that. But if I go back and look at the list of things that are in the image in the, of the HTTPD. If I, some stuff I probably don't care about and we'll talk about that later, but is there anything missing? I looked at it and uh, after a while I figured that the HTTPD software itself is missing. Like the one thing that I downloaded the image for actually was not there in the list of software that contained, that was contained in the image. And if you work on this kind of software and if you know how they work, it's actually quite obvious because uh, there's no additional metadata that is put there at build time that actually tells you that this is the HTTPD server. It's probably a binary, it's actually a binary that is built with uh, uh, a compiler and then it's uh, stuck in the, in the image. So it doesn't come with any additional thing. So we know, we know it. Um, the question is, what if we built the software uh, bill of material as bomb not just by uh, running software composition analysis, but we could put our own data in there. And so here comes the uh, discussion about S bomb. Zach is a great expert at that. Uh, so uh, th thanks Zach for telling us more about uh, uh, the S bombs. Yeah, so the, the issues Luca just told us about all had to do with this content detection phase, right? If we had a perfect list of all the software in our image ahead of time, we wouldn't have to do that. And that's what the promise of the software bill of materials is. Um, so you can think about software composition analysis, the content detection as reverse engineering. You go to Taco Bell, you eat a quesarito, you 
taste it, you squeeze it, you try to figure out what's in it, and then you go home and you try to make the same thing. Uh, but often you don't quite nail it. You, you, it's very, very hard to figure out what exactly is in your container image. Uh, and this is true of food as well. Uh, and so a very overused uh, analogy, but overused because it's quite useful, is that an SVOM is an ingredients list for software, right? It tells you what's in your application, what's in your container image, and then there's maybe a warning at the bottom that says may contain CVE 2014-0160. Um, and SVOMs can be produced in a number of ways. Uh, one way to do it is exactly like Luca was just saying, uh, sort of this post hoc software composition analysis. Um, and we do this by looking inside a container image, looking at metadata like the uh, app uh, database on your Debian in instance. Um, but you could also imagine creating one of these lists of ingredients at build time. Uh, why? Because that's when you have the most information. That's when you know what you're actually putting in there. Um, and so these SBOMs will contain package I information, dependency metadata, uh, cryptographic caches of the content, so you know exactly what is and what is not in, in kind of that um, software. And so uh, here's an example. You don't have to read every line of this, just trying to give you the flavor of it, uh, but it's like a text format. It tells you some metadata about the format itself. That's SPDX is one of these formats. Um, tells you kind of, okay, here's a repo on, you know, GitHub that, that we're tied to. Uh, it tells you metadata about who created this. So in, in this case, there's a person that created it. There's also a tool that was used to create this. And this is just for a very simple hello world kind of binary. Um, it gives you some information about individual packages. So in, in this case, there's just the one package, hello bin. It tells you where the source came from, it tells you what the commit was that it came from, it tells you the license of it, and, and so on. Um, and then it tells you a lot about like the dependency relationships within that, within that application. It tells you, okay, you know, your package depends on this package, depends on that package. And, and you can embed kind of the whole graph in this plain text format. Uh, which is not very nice to read. It's not super human friendly, uh, but there are tools for kind of visualizing and so on. And so where, where did these things come from? Uh, for a long time, as long as people have been consuming software, they've kind of wanted to know what was in it. And so uh, for a while what we did is we just said, hey, take, take your lowest paid intern, give them you know, Microsoft Excel and have them like, make a catalog of all the you know, libraries that you're installing, all the libraries that you're importing. Um, and then you know, sometime around 2010 or so, uh, the SPDX group uh, formed under the Linux Foundation. Uh, and actually, this project wasn't designed with cybersecurity in mind. It was designed for open source license compliance. Uh, and at first blush, this might seem unrelated, right? What a, what a licenses have to do with vulnerabilities. But the first step in both cases is knowing what's actually inside the application. If you're linking against a vulnerable version of OpenSSL, you could have a vulnerability. If you're linking against you know, a library that's AGPL licensed, you could have some legal problems. And so after about you know, five or six years, uh, the Cyclone DX project kind of made an initial release, and that comes actually out of OWASP. And so this is interesting because we're starting to see a cybersecurity focused group really investing in SBOMs. And SPDX along the way has picked up a number of features that make it useful for vulnerability analysis. Uh, after a few years of that, uh, folks started to notice, hey, it's not actually that useful for you to tell me just this application contains this library. What if they didn't call the vulnerable function? What if they, you know, like it, it doesn't give you enough information about exploitability. So VEX or Vulnerability Exploitability Exchange came on the scene around 2019, which lets you mark software as affected by a vulnerability, not affected by a vulnerability and so on. Um, and then in 2021, uh, the U.S. federal government issued an executive order, 14028, that says all vendors to U.S. government must provide SBOMs, and there's some, some details on timing and so on, but it has caused a mad scramble, and a, a billion companies have started uh, uh, to, to solve all your, all your organization's SBOM problems if only you, you write them a fat check. Um, but missing from all of this, I think, is a notion of quality. Uh, and so on the right I have an empty nutrition facts label because maybe that's technically compliant, right? Uh, the NTIA has, has guidance on the minimum elements of an SBOM and it talks about identifiers for components, it talks about version numbers, it talks about dependency relationships. Nowhere there does it say that you actually have, have to have HTTPD in your HTTP image SBOM, 
right? Um, and so uh, Luca alluded briefly to this term software dark matter, which is, which is a term uh, my colleague came up with to kind of uh, describe if you have, say, like a container image uh, and you go through the SBOM for that container image, what percentage of files can be explained by that SBOM? Ideally, you'd want it to be 100%. You'd, you'd know, you know, uh, these things come from the OS and these libraries come from this package and so on. Uh, but actually, if you look at popular images on Docker Hub, you, you actually find a majority of files are unexplained. They're, they're sort of, if you run popular scanner tools, the scanner tools can't tell you the cause of a number of these packages. And there's a couple of reasons why, and Luca, Luca did a good job illustrating some of these. Uh, the big one is that scans are missing software that you're not installing via like a very well-defined package manager. Uh, and so if you're, if you're cobbling together your container image by you know, copying files in from here and copying files in from there, all of those are going to be not accounted for. Um, and any SBOMs that are coming at build time, which is, which is kind of my preferred time to be generating these things, that is a good way to not have this problem of dark matter, but you need a lot of support from the build tooling, and that's that takes time to put in place. You need your compiler to support it. You need your you know you need Make to support it. You need all, all of that. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over now to Luca to talk about. Okay, so even imagine we solved all those problems. We had a perfect SBOM that had all a list of all the software in your container image. Are we done? And um, you may note by looking at your watches and the fact that we still have some more time on this talk, the answer is no. Thank you, Zach. So, yes, uh, I really, now I imagine I have my perfect test bomb. Either SCA generated or we actually wrote it uh, uh, with uh, any build time tooling, uh, with any help, uh, or a combination of the two. Now what? Well, now we turn to our vulnerability database uh, and we do the magic. So the problem is there are many vulnerability databases and these are just a few. You get uh, like the MVD that I'm sure that many of us have looked at. Uh, we've got uh, some uh, uh, open source uh, some open source parts like uh, GitHub and GitLab. We got vendors. Uh, we got uh, uh, paid for vulnerability databases that have their own goals and scope. So. What's going on there? Well, it means that in your scanner, whether it's software composition analysis or vulnerability scanner, there's another magic box inside. That's the magic box that even if you use open source, you might not be seeing it, but they have the code to deploy it yourself. It takes all these databases and squashes them together into one single vulnerability database that can be used to detect. And building that database is much, much trickier than we can think. So. Um, in, in a lot of cases, uh, this is great, because if you think about it, vendors, especially vulnerability, um, uh, sorry, uh, distribution vendors, tell us exactly which vulnerabilities are in their packages, and they know it because they maintain the package and they know exactly what to look for. So uh, that's great. And uh, now, with uh, if you think about GitHub and GitLab, for example, we have. Uh, uh, package uh, uh, maintainers that can put data in a standard format uh, there in their package so that uh, you can actually take a look and it's written in some format uh, that uh, a scanner can conform to. However, not everything is uh, that great. For example, we have uh, all, we have been speaking about the software package type before, if you think about the Java, Go, whatever, we spoke about it, but not all software can be uh, reconducted somehow to this kind of package types. Think about the HTTPD server. It's not a, you know, it's not a Go package or it's not anything like that. So what do you do there? And also we got software that come from vendors. So it's not in an open source ecosystem. So what do you do th with them? Uh, and also vulnerability databases uh, are a beast of their own. They all have different goals uh, and they're, so they're inconsistent from each other because they're slightly different, but also between themselves they can be a bit inconsistent. So, of course, let's take a look at an example. I like concepts, but I scan images. I want to be secure. So, in order to be secure, I scan my PostgreSQL image and uh, in the SBOM that was generated by SCA, I can find Postgres. So, we don't have the HTTP problem. Uh, it's there. It's version 15.2. This is great. Now let's go to the vulnerability checking part. So we got eight vulnerabilities. 
There are actually four, because four of them are just duplicated. But that's okay, because uh, the Debian maintainers that have compiled that security list know what they're doing. So if there's two libraries that are affected by the same vulnerability from OpenSSL, they will, uh, they will mark both. Also, I really want to know about this OpenSSL vulnerable version, because I have Postgres, and Postgres is going to connect securely I hope with OpenSSL, so if there's a bug there, I, I do really want to know. Is that, is that all? No. If I go to NVD, the National Vulnerability Database, uh, I can take a look at that there is a vulnerability with the CVID, and that vulnerability is uh, uh, something about Postgres itself. So uh, we had Postgres in the S-bomb. Uh, we had somehow data about the vulnerability, but we couldn't match the vulnerability, so we don't have it uh, in the scanner output. Why is that? So I also took a look at how the, the SBOM is generating and what database I'm looking at, uh, and uh, the package here is detected as a D package, so Debian software. And uh, the scanner knows that it needs to match Debian software with the Debian, Debian security database. Does the Debian security database have information on that vulnerability? Yes, it does. But it only applies if the package has been distributed by a Debian maintainer, because this is how it works. By contract, that database works only for that. And if we take a look at the Docker file for that Postgres image, we find that pretty much the Docker file had the APT repo for Postgres and not for Debian, because of course Postgres authors use their own. Uh, repository, meaning that the, our scanner is unable to find the vulnerability. That sounds sad, but you might think, I know, I know, I saw the database before. You can't fool me, it's there. I, I know that there is this uh, national vulnerability database, uh, database maintained by the uh, US government from NIST, uh, so it's something that's really in, uh, part of the standards, uh, of the standards body. So, what? It's there. It's called PostgreSQL. Can I match it? Maybe, can I do some kind of match to find, to put that data in there? And that's really tempting, uh, but, and scanners have attempted, but it looks like it, everything fits in. It's, it looks perfect. Like, I mean, that's great. But if you try to focus there, you will notice that it does not. And there's no standard way to match information coming from any vulnerability database, including NVD, just generically with everything else. Uh, for example, I'll give you an example of what I tried to do at some point, as usual. I tried to do a lot of stuff. But we had uh, this uh, org.bouncycastle cryptography library for Java that's called bcprov JDK, JDK 16 in the Java manifest. And it's vulnerable to something. And I don't know if you can read it, uh, but uh, it says that uh, the CPE, which is the NVD way of telling you a product name, is uh, bouncy castle column BC dash Java. It's okay. So maybe I can try to match that somehow. Not sure what, not sure how. Uh, but then I found another vulnerability, and it said that the same software had the CPE name of bouncy castle. And uh, you cannot read it, but it says Legion of the Bouncy Castle Java Cryptography API with dashes in the middle, and that's the, the name. So the idea is that uh, uh, this database, for example, has probably not been designed with this purpose in mind. And trying to use it uh, just directly to match vulnerabilities, it's probably going to end up uh, with uh, a lot of false positives uh, and uh, a lot of problems for whoever uses it. So which means that uh, I believe that the information is somehow there. We are moving somewhere, and uh, uh, we, we have, uh, and uh, uh, Zach will uh, tell us uh, a bit more about, uh, uh, as an industry or as an uh, open source project, uh, as uh, people that work on these things, uh, what are the newest uh, opportunities that we have? What, uh, how is it that we can try to improve the situation, and what are we experimenting on? Yeah, thanks, Luca. So if you wanted a talk that ended on kind of a doom and gloom note, you should have gone to an offensive talk. Uh, we're going we're gonna to talk through kind of, you know, Luca mentioned a bunch of problems, but I think many of them are, if not fully solvable, things that we can mitigate. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a lightning tour of some of the most exciting stuff happening in this space.
Oh, so the first is that there are some alternatives that are that are popping up to the NVD. Uh, and so Luca, you know, I'm not going to show you the same slide again, but had a bunch of logos. You know, it's got VulnDB, it's got the NVD, it's got the Debian, you know, security advisories. GitHub's got its own. And competition is actually really, really good here, especially as the world moves to more and more OSS, whether the software products are OSS themselves or they just depend on open source software. Um, you know, sort of a, a world where we open source packages fit really, really nicely into the schemas of these databases is a good thing. Um, and so I think uh, the hope is not obviously that we have 20 mutually incompatible databases forever, but rather that we can kind of take the best ideas from each and develop sort of interoperability around that in a way where we can match packages to software really, really nicely. And so this is, this is a great example of where there's some innovation. Um, there are better links to packages. And so one is uh, for GitHub security advisories, all of these are kind of tied back to source repositories. And if you have source, actually, we no longer really have to play this guessing game around like, oh, is version you know 1.5.3 hyphen deb like later than or greater than, you know, or before this, you know, 1.5.2, uh, like that's, that's a really tough game. And if you have the source and you know what source a package was built from, you can kind of cut out that, that sort of step in the middle. Another thing that we're doing is, is we're sort of evolving. So, uh, NVD, as Luca mentioned, has these CPEs, which is their naming scheme for software packages. Uh, there's a couple of alternatives that are emerging. Uh, there's these package URLs or pearls, uh, and that's this very open source repository focused uh, kind of identifier for a software package inversion. Uh, there's these software heritage identifiers, these SWHIDs. That's what you see to the right. And that can identify not just you know source, but also specific lines of code, which is actually really useful for knowing where a vulnerability is coming from. Uh, and then you have these uh, SWIDs, which are uh, garish XML that is not going to fit on my screen, so I don't have an example. Um, but another thing I want to talk about is sort of this talk has been largely about false negatives, and that's a really, really big concern. Your scanner tool tells you you're all good, no vulnerabilities, but actually, you know, you had HTTPD in there and it's got some zero, you know, or some well-known severe vulnerability. Um, but the flip side of that problem is false positives, and I, I argue that these are actually two sides of basically the same coin. And so uh, my company has a report uh, freely available. Uh, don't have to give your email or anything. I think it's kind of interesting where we basically just went out and scanned these like popular images on Docker Hub and we said how many, if you're using one of these things as kind of the base on which to build your application, how many vulnerabilities are you just inheriting like off, off the bat? Um, and the answer is often hundreds, uh, right? And so maybe none of these are exploitable, maybe none of them really matter, but like wouldn't you rather see that number be zero so you didn't even have to go back and check? Um, and even if you did, even if you went and checked all of these and you said, okay, we're all good, we're actually accumulating, you know, multiple vulnerabilities per day on some of these images on average. So it's not that just this one and done, it's this kind of ongoing task. And I've heard people say, you know, for every week of time that happens in the real world, we have, you know, 10 engineering weeks that are, that are spent investigating the false positive vulnerabilities that are popping up. And that's just like really a ton of work and not super sustainable. So there's a couple of approaches we can take to kind of get around that. Um, one is to sort of have less stuff in your applications and in your container images. And so you can see on the left, these are kind of, you know, the, just the default images for Node, Python, PHP. On the right, you see the sort of slimmed down versions of these same thing. Often they're based on uh, Alpine Linux, which is a Linux distro uh, that tends to be pretty minimal in its footprint, as opposed to uh, one of these, you know, many of the images on the left are based on, you know, Debian or Ubuntu, which are basically full-blown, you know, operating systems, which come with all of the stuff that you'd want on a server running on its own. If you're running in containers, eh, you can get rid of a lot of it. And so you, just by doing that, you're going down from hundreds to maybe tens or even single-digit numbers of vulnerabilities. Uh, but even that, you know, doesn't get rid of all of the false positives. And so Sysdig has some really cool research based on the same technology that powers their open source tool Falco um, about, hey, you have a bunch of vulnerabilities in your images, but if we actually look what's going on at runtime, 
these packages, you know, or like this code might not even get loaded. It might not even exist in your image. And so even though your SBOM says you have this package, you're not calling the parts of the code that are, that are effective at all. Um, finally, we can, we can also kind of get better SBOMs with sort of uh, declarative builders. So one of the things I was saying before is it's really hard to get good information about the contents of a container image, for instance, uh, because the build tooling doesn't support it natively. Uh, and if you look, so this is an example Docker file just from, from the Docker official documentation. If you look, uh, it's throwing away information. It's actually getting rid of metadata that's in the image in the sake of trying to, you know, slim down in, in size. These Docker files are basically just shell scripts, and the output of the shell script is, you know, an image that's got some stuff installed. And they're really, really easy to write, which is great for prototyping and great for getting something out fast. Uh, it's bad for reasoning about, especially in an automated, machine-friendly way. Uh, and another, one of the big problems is that they're not hermetic. And what I mean by that is there are a lot of implicit dependencies. If you run this code today and you run it tomorrow, you're going to get totally different uh, images as the output. Why is that? Because the Ubuntu base image might change out from under you. Uh, because the apt repository gets updated and you're going to get a different version of CA certificates, you know, tomorrow from what you get to today. And so... This style, this very like imperative shell scripty style of building container images is not super friendly to reliable SBOMs. But you can use a declarative builder. And so one example of that is an open source tool called APKO that my company works on uh, that uh, is, lets you build OCI images by basically assembling them from software packages. And when you do this, you're sort of eliminating that dark matter by design. The only thing that's winding up in these container images is listed explicitly in the manifest of packages that get installed. If you want extra files on there, you have to package them up with accompanying metadata first. And so this enforces that your SBOM is complete, and it enforces that that SBOM metadata is accurate and, and useful. And there's a bunch of other benefits to this as well. Uh, the resulting container images are often smaller. Uh, updating libraries is easier. Uh, you get faster builds. You get reproducible builds. Uh, it's very friendly to caching and, and so on. And so I think as the tooling gets better, then this is just one example. You can do the exact same thing for applications. You can have sort of, you know, GCC maybe producing better metadata. You can have, uh, you know, your, your package manager for your language producing better metadata and so on. And as, the, as we get improvements here, sort of the SBOM quality is going to go up, which is going to lead to lots and lots of improvements in not having false positives and also not having false negatives. And finally, I'm going to just tease some sort of ongoing work uh, that, that uh, my company's working on uh, on automated vulnerability analysis. And this is based on an insight, and we're not the first people to have this by any means, that what you're not calling isn't going to hurt you. And so uh, we have some tooling for basically taking a vulnerability, figuring out what patch fixed that vulnerability, uh, what functions were vulnerable to that vulnerability. If it's only in the function foo and you don't call foo, maybe you're not worried about it tracing back to entry points in a library and then trying to figure out does your application actually call the code that contained the vulnerability or not. Uh, and if it doesn't, you might not be vulnerable. And that's exactly what something like VEX is for. And so we can sort of automatically issue VEX statements. And so this is stuff that we're going to publish that's going to be all, all open source. And I think, again, it's increasing the granularity. It's increasing sort of the amount of information we have about your application and whether a vulnerability affects it. And I think that's, that's sort of the overall direction we're moving towards. Better, better quality information and more of it lets us make better decisions. Uh, so I'm going to turn it back over to Luca just to, to wrap things up. Thank you, Zach. And thank you all for listening to us. Basically, uh, I just want to, to end uh, uh, by saying that the, the point of, uh, by pretty much repeating the point of what we said, Basically, the fact that uh, uh, we have tools to try and keep track of our vulnerabilities, to try and see what we can, uh, what we should fix, what we should prioritize, uh, and all these things. But uh, the idea is that we have to know how they work, and we have to know what is it that we are looking for. There's no single or even even like standard combination of things that is going to save us and that is, is going to be working for everyone. So, and uh, yeah, of course, uh, no open source piece of software, no vendor produced solution will just 
magically work for every use case. Uh, the idea is that uh, we have seen that software composition analysis is super cool. It can do stuff that we need, but we need to know when it can work and when it cannot, when it cannot detect stuff. We've seen that SPOM generation at build time uh, is pretty awesome, but it's not always possible to do it. We should try, and in some cases, we might even end up with an empty ingredient list, so we should be wary of that. And uh, vulnerability databases have their flaws, they're written by humans, uh, and uh, you know, they, they have their things. But if we know how they work, and if we know what we are looking for, we exactly know what's, what's going on. And uh, we, have the, uh, we have a lot of uh, things that are happening in, in general, in, uh, in the open source world, in the industry, that uh, we, can, uh, we can look forward to. We have seen how, uh, for example, Taking uh, minimal base images will reduce our risks. Not always uh, that is possible, but uh, it's been a few years uh, since uh, I've been around and I've seen uh, these kind of uh, minimal base images, and it's great to see that we are moving moving there. And we've seen that runtime insights uh, are actually a pretty nice way to prioritize vulnerabilities because uh, a resource says so, but it's not a silver bullet. You can, uh, uh, you know, it can help. And in general, uh, and we also have bleeding edge uh, research uh, from academia and from industry that says that, uh, hey, we can even do function level analysis to try and figure this and get something good out of, out of everything and try to make sense out of all this uh, data. And, uh, and at the end of the day, using a tool and just shoving those results to engineers will never work. So will absolutely never work. So you know your environment better than everyone else, uh, and you know which tools will work. Uh, and by doing that, uh, you, uh, you will be able to figure this out. And uh, if, if you're like me, when you're in doubt, you just try it. Uh, and if no tool uh, is useful to you, you just do your custom thing, which I had to do for, my, uh, for the open source software that I maintain that's written in C++. So it's very, very hard to, to make uh, all of this work. But we are also moving to, to get these things going. Thank you so much for uh, listening to us. Uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, so if you have any uh, we are we're happy to to know about them. Also, we've got some. Uh, they gave us some extra books for the for the software that I work uh, work at. That's Falco. If you ask a question and you're interested, uh, you can take uh, this already book. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Um, when you talked about the automated, the new generation sort of automated analysis tools, is any of that looking across the container or is it inside a code base? Because what happens is like for third party libraries, some of the most vulnerable are endpoint implementation kind of libraries, right? But a lot of times those are only called or not called as a matter of configuration, right? Like how is this endpoint configured in this deployment? And it was very easy to have an island of code that looks like it's not called but it is called in an as deployed environment. Yeah, so that's a, that's a really great question. And I think the, the trick here when we're automating uh, these sorts of things is to be humble about what we can say for sure and what we can't say for sure. Uh, and so the context that uh, I, I'm sort of talking about is one where we have source available for everything, which is like really the, the best possible situation to be in. Uh, so what you're describing where sort of whether a uh, function gets called in a vulnerable way or not is a matter of configuration, that would get flagged as potentially vulnerable in a system like this because we can't say for sure that it doesn't. So if you, if you sort of just try to limit what you're doing to just saying what you know for sure, that's already enough to get rid of many, many false positives, which means that we can, for the trickier edge cases, we can actually spend our human time looking at those as opposed to having our humans spending hours and hours clicking not affected, not affected, not affected, and have their eyes glaze over before they get to the sort of really more interesting edge cases. Uh, but I think, I think in general, like what you want is to be able to say what, like, I, I sort of have a vision, and this is very long term, but for, for sort of vulnerabilities as having kind of policies associated with them that indicate under what circumstances is this exploitable? And for being able to propagate that 
through the, through the um, whole dependency graph. And so if you can say, ah, this is exploitable when called with you know, this string in front of it, well, okay, we can, we can all the way track through and say, do, does there ever any user provided input that gets propagated through that? And if you can kind of keep that, if you have the source for everything, you can kind of propagate backwards from the vulnerability to know if something's affected or not. Now, this is extremely like sci-fi, uh, and it's not something we're gonna do in the next you know year or two. But I, th I think as these vulnerability databases get better, we're gonna see increasing levels of sophistication in sort of the exploitability conditions and how those are described. And so my hope is that eventually we'll be able to handle cases like the one that you're saying and this sort of end-to-end -end graph, because. A vulnerability really only exists at runtime, right? And so uh, at runtime is kind of the only place we can make, we can rule certain things out beforehand, but we can't say for sure whether something is or isn't affected until we have all that information. Um, so no answers, you know, firm today, but, but I think in the long run, yeah, the, this sort of whole space is moving in a direction of being able to render verdicts in cases like that. More questions? Okay, one back. Oh, oh. Uh, hi. So I recently completed my graduation, and it's only been three months of working for me. So we are like pretty new to uh, CVE. What I have noticed in my company, I will not take a company name right now, but uh, what I have noticed is that we do edge bomb and S bomb. We get from the vendors, and we are doing the black duck scan. So we get like all the CVE which are there, all the high they fix, but they keep the same version. Let's say if they are using the version 4.6 and there's already a new version available. So what the vendors are doing, they are using the same version 4.6 and they are saying like, okay, these are all the high peaks, we will fix that. So what are the different ways to uh, address this or like what will be the advice which I can give to the company to update the system? Because definitely this is not a good way and doing a black duck scan and providing that uh, report to the vendors and if they are fixing it, there's no way to track it. Vendors say we have fixed it. Okay, we need to rely on them. So what will be the better way? And uh, again, they are not updating the version. So is there any tools or software which can keep track like maybe after six months because medium issues are not fixed. So they may populate as in high issues in the later time. The version is not updated. So how should we address or what would be uh, advice which I can give to the company executives about it? Hey, so uh, I'd like to really to better understand your question. So you're talking about software that uh, is provided uh, by a vendor or by uh, a project, right? So it's got maybe the version 4.6 uh, of a vulnerable dependency and uh, the vendor or the open source package provider is not fixing that. So maybe after months, uh, you see that that vulnerability is still there. Uh, yes? Yes, so let's say uh, they have provided the S-bomb. We do the Black Duck scan. Yes. We found the vulnerability that, okay, 4.6 is affected with the three high, four medium, and let's say two low. Uh, right now, latest version is already available, 5.0, which have all the fixes. But the vendor says that if we will update the version, we need to fix other softwares as well in the dependency because there's a dependency based on version as well. So they fix all the high versions, keep a high CVE in the 4.6 as well, keeping the same version. But moving forward, right now it's fixed. But after six months, they may populate as in high issue. So what are the better way to address this? So, uh, of, co of course, uh, I don't have a, a you know a solution to to these problems because they affect uh, all of us. If you have ever maintained uh, a piece of software or if you have been a vendor, you know that this is a problem because, uh, uh, as as I was saying, in the real world, you can just have everything up to date. Because, for example, 5.0 of that software has a breaking change, so the vendor cannot do anything about it uh, without maybe one month or uh, two months of uh, uh, of development work uh, just to update a version number. So that's something that uh, you also might not want to do in your own environment. Uh, the thing is, you said that uh, sometimes uh, it can happen that vendors backport patches uh, even to the previous version. I think the most important part uh, is knowing uh, 
if the vendor is doing that uh, and having a database that works for that vendor. For example, I have experience with Red Hat. Red Hat does this all the time. If you have a, you can have a Python 2.7, which was out of, uh, uh, you know, out of support uh, from the Py from Python years ago, but Red Hat will have a version of it that has all the vulnerabilities. And uh, this is uh, yet another reason why you cannot match versions generically. If uh, if I try to match that Python 2.7 to the list of CVEs that 2.7 has, it looks like Red Hat has lots of vulnerabilities. Uh, so uh, the the only pro the only thing you can do is working with the vendor or the or the open source uh, uh, software uh, producer. So it yes. looks like we're just about at time. Uh, so I think there's. We can we can, I there. think okay. I think there was a question from uh, prior from earlier. <laughs> But then we'll stick around. We'll stick around if anyone wants to take it off. Okay. Yeah, it uh, should be a pretty easy answer. Um, so just to lay up, right? So um, uh, as far as like uh, new vulnerabilities are discovered all the time, you might have something that's discovered. And how long do you do you feel like it takes for the S bomb to finally kind of catch up with? Oh wait, hold on, that affected everything, every package in our uh, in the S bomb. Or whatever it happens to be, the the relationships between things need to update uh, as you get new information. Correct. Well, uh, I think in general, if you have the if you have a good S bomb, the vulnerability information uh, will actually be already up to date. Because if the S bomb tells you what the dependencies are, once uh, a vulnerability is detected in a dependency, you will be able to tell exactly what's going on there. Yeah, right. But I, th I think there is also an element of what's the life cycle of the vulnerability as it gets reported. And this is actually pretty complicated because often there's like a year long embargo period or like, so from the time that a researcher discovers a vulnerability in a piece of software to the time that there's anything in the CVE database at, at all could be months and months and months. Uh, and then from there you have to say, well, okay, does it have all of the metadata that you would need to successfully do this matching? And often that happens very after the fact. And then as things get patched, you know, uh, distro maintainers will say, okay, our, our, you know, plus deb three version of this thing is not affected, but our plus deb two is. And for that to get populated, I, I would say it sort of spirals around in equilibrium as opposed to it goes from no information to good information in a day. Um, when I started working on these things, I like to think that uh, in an ideal world, the SBORN is the same and vulnerabilities only get, get added and never removed. It was really wrong. <laughs> it was really, really wrong. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Zach and Luca. That was great. And thank you, everybody. I hope you had a great day. Thank you.